plains lay that seemed the expanse of God's wide sleep. Thought's wings climbed up towards heaven's vast repose, lost in blue deeps of immortality. A changed earth nature felt the breath of peace. Air seemed an ocean of felicity or the couch of the unknown spiritual rest, a vast quiescence swallowing up all sound into a voicelessness of utter bliss. Even matter brought a close spiritual touch, all thrilled with the immanence of one divine. The lowest of these earths was still a heaven, translating into the splendor of things divine the beauty and brightness of terrestrial scenes. Eternal mountains, ridge on gleaming ridge, whose lines were graved as on a sapphire plate and etched the borders of heaven's lustrous noon, climbed like piled temple stairs and from their heads of topless meditation heard below the approach of a blue pilgrim multitude and listened to a great arriving voice of the wide travel hymn of timeless seas. A chanting crowd from mountain bosoms slipped past branches fragrant with a sigh of flowers, hurrying through sweetnesses with revel leaps, the murmurous rivers of felicity divinely rippled, honey-voiced desires, mingling their sister eddies of delight. Then, widening to a pace of calm-lipped muse, down many glimmered estuaries of dream went whispering into lakes of liquid peace. On a brink held of senseless ecstasy and guarding an eternal poise of thought sat sculptured souls dreaming by rivers of sound in changeless attitudes of marble bliss. Around her lived the children of God's day in an unspeakable felicity, a happiness never lost, the immortal's ease, a glad eternity's blissful multitude. Around the deathless nations moved and spoke, souls of a luminous celestial joy, faces of stark beauty, limbs of the molded ray. 
in cities cut like gems of conscious stone and wonderful pastures and on gleaming coasts bright forms were seen eternity's luminous tribes so last week we read that Savitri has risen into the world of everlasting day and there that is really a paradise heaven and there she could see the seven immortal earths homes of the blessed released from death and sleep so again it's a kind of heaven where the souls who achieve deliverance they can live there in those countries of the seven immortal earths so that is what we are reading about uh, today there one could see vast plains that seemed like the expanse of God's wide sleep they are so peaceful lying beneath the sun and above is a blue sky thoughts wings climbed up towards heaven's vast repose lost in blue deeps of immortality that's what you should read rosa yeah lays like the sea the expanse of God's wide sleep God's wings climb 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 up towards heaven's last repose lost in the blue deeps of Yes. So plains they are the, the flat lands. Especially in North India there are very very vast plains. But these are not in North India, they are in some heavenly country and they are so wide an expanse, a very wide space. it seems as if god would be sleeping there they are wide enough for him to lie down and sleep and peaceful enough and then he says thoughts wings so we can have winged thoughts that rise higher and higher they climbed up towards heaven's vast repose so this is also very wide and vast and open the sky hmm? there the the thoughts wing up perhaps like birds and they get lost in the heights in those blue deeps of immortality they can go further and further and further and reach a state a deep state of immortality this is a very different kind of poetry to what we have been reading recently no? we've been following the narrative of savitri's story and her debate with death Shrobindo is a great nature poet but here he's using the language of nature poetry to tell about scenes that are beyond our earth altogether so 
he has to give us hints to help us imagine what those heavenly worlds are like. Martin, you would read. The change of nature fell the breath of peace. Air seemed an ocean of felicity. For the couch, the unknown spirit to the rest. The vast quiescence swallowing up all sound into a voicelessness of utter bliss. <coughs> Even matter brought a close spiritual touch. <coughs> All truth is the imminence of one divine. Yes. So in those seven immortal earths, the earth nature that we are familiar with was changed, it was transformed. And there it could feel peace, which we rarely feel here on earth. And the air, the atmosphere there, seemed like a limitless ocean of felicity, of happiness, peaceful happiness. Or maybe it's like a couch, a bed for the unknown, spiritual rest. There's something so restful and peaceful about it. And everything is very, very quiet and still, quiescent. It means not reacting, just being very, very still, quiet. That quietness seems to swallow up all sound. No sound can be heard. It swallows it up into a state of utter bliss, such intense bliss, such intense ecstasy and delight that no sound can be uttered, voicelessness. It's an intense concentration in bliss. And even matter, substance, brought a close spiritual touch. That doesn't happen to us with our ordinary matter unless we're in a very, very special state. No? But there, the matter brought a close spiritual touch and everything thrilled. There was some intense feeling with the immanence of one divine. Immanence, it means dwelling within. So with it, dwelling within all those forms and appearances and the atmospheres is the one divine and that one divine can be felt. There's a, a thrill of that presence. Chandra. The lowest of his gifts was still a Translating into the splendor of things given, the beauty and brightness of it, terrestrial things. Yes, do you know this word terrestrial, Chandra? Mm -hmm. No, it means earthly. The, th the scenes that we see here on earth, the, one of the names of our earth is terra, mm -hmm. the earth, terrestrial what has to do with our earth. So we have a certain beauty and brightness in our, some of our earthly scenes, no? But there, in the lowest of those seven immortal earths, they must be arranged in a hierarchy, they, the, they, it was translating the beauty and brightness of earthly scenes into the splendor, the intense beauty of divine, of things divine. And these are general statements Shobindo has been giving. Now he's going to give some more detailed descriptions. Dana Lakshmi. Eternal mountains, 
So try to see this picture, mountains, eternal mountains. We can think of the Himalayas and they are shining, a ridge, one ridge of mountains and behind another and another and another. They are gleaming and it looks as if the lines of them have been engraved. Engraving is a kind of drawing that we do with um, acid on a metal plate. It gives a very, very fine line. So these eternal mountains, they are also bluish. They are in the distance and they look bluish. So it looks as if their lines have been engraved on a plate that is a sapphire color, the color of that beautiful blue gemstone. These lines etched the borders of heaven's lustrous noon. So they are, uh, this is also like, um, like graving, it's done with acid. So the heaven the sky, the way that it is at midday, at noontime, an intense blue onto that sky. It's as if we can just see the outlines of those blue mountains. It's all wonderfully blue. And they are, uh, we see the lowest ones first and then higher and higher and higher. So these mountains are like piled temple stairs going up and up. And, of course, at the very summit, then they have just the sky above them. It's as if those mountains are meditating. They are sending their winged thoughts up into the sky. And there's no top, there's no li upper limit at all. No? There they are, as if in deep concentration, meditation. But they can hear, coming up from below, the approach of a blue pilgrim multitude. Pilgrims are coming to climb those mountains. And uh, as they come, they sing special songs. Those can be heard even from the top of the mountains. So there's the voice of those approaching pilgrim multitude, those souls who are climbing higher and higher and higher. And they, the mountains also listen to a great voice which is arriving, which is coming. It's the voice of timeless seas. The mountains above the seas below, and from the tops of the mountains, can hear the sound of the sea, which is always coming. You know? The wide travel hymn of timeless seas. As if the seas, like the pilgrims, are singing. You know? They have a special sacred song that they sing as they move. You know? Ananti. Chanting love to mount the bosom sleep, but branches struggle with sad flowers. Hurry through sweetnesses wheel, sorry, with little lips, the murmurous rivers of felicity, divine little honey voice of sigh, mingling their sister's heaviness of the light. Then, widening 
So this is about the rivers, hmm? the streams. First of all, it's like a crowd of streams pouring down from the higher levels of the mountain, coming as if the mountain from the mountain's bosom, these streams are slipping out and they pass through the forests there, full of branches, fragrant, with a sigh of flowers, beautifully perfumed flowers, breathing. But the streams are hurrying, hurrying downwards through sweetnesses, all those sweet scenes of the forest, with revel leaps, as if they are having great fun leaping down the mountain like, uh, young, like young goats or like children. Hmm? These are the murmurous rivers of felicity. They make a sound, a lovely sound, as they leap down the mountainside. But they are rivers of happiness. And uh, the sound of their voices, divinely rippled, honey-voiced desires. Desires, wishes, that are sweet like honey. It's in the sound of the rippling of the rivers. And, of course, they start off near the tops, but then as they come downwards, they come together, they join, mingling their sister eddies of delight. So the, the streams are female. I think rivers are always female in, uh, in India, in Indian languages. No? So when two rivers meet, it's like two sisters meeting and embracing. And then they become wider and wider and they don't leap down so much. Uh, they move more slowly, widening to a pace, a steady slower movement, as if they, now they are not reveling, now they are musing, they are meditative, thoughtful. They pass down many glimmered estuaries of dream. An estuary is usually where the river um, moves into the sea. And it often happens that that's a flat area because the river has brought down lots of uh, silt, of soil, and it's built up a flat area. And there, there are many streams again, no? estuaries. So it is like that. They, they, they flow down many glimmered estuaries of dream. So those estuaries, those streams are glimmering, gleaming in the light and slowly without any noise they went whispering into lakes beautiful uh, lakes of liquid peace <laughs> so these are some of the scenes which have some kind of tr they translate the beauty and brightness of terrestrial scenes, but it's something way beyond. Uh, Joel, would you read? On the brink hand of senseless ecstasy, enduring an eternal voice of thought, sat sculpture, souls dreaming by rivers of sound, in changeless attitudes, of hmm. So, of course, in the Himalayas, you will see beside the rivers um, sadhus sitting in concentration. Hmm. So it is like this. But these beings, these souls, are in ecstasy, 
on, a, on an edge of ecstasy, almost beyond senses, beyond any sense of ecstasy. They're just on the very edge of going into uh, some different consciousness. No? And they, keep, they guard, they keep the same poise, the same um, position, an eternal poise of thought. They look as if they've been sculptured out of marble, sculptured souls. There they are, dreaming. They don't see the rivers because their eyes are closed, but they hear the rivers. And they are there in their changeless attitudes, their poise of marble bliss, as if they have been carved out of marble, holding that position for a long time. Sergei. The laughter leads the children of God's day with unspeakable felicity, a happiness never left. The immortals is a great eternity, blissful multitude. So that's what Savitri feels, that all around her are living the children who belong to this world, not just children, all the people, the beings who are born of this world, of God's day, everlasting day. And they live in a felicity, a state of happiness that we can't express. It's unspeakable. It's a happiness that's never lost. They are enjoying the ease, the easiness, the peacefulness, the happiness of the immortals, the deathless beings. They are a multitude. There's a lot of them, a blissful multitude who belong to that glad eternity. Glad is a, another word for happy. Hmm? Ganga Lakshmi. Around the deathless nation move and spoke. Source of luminous celestial joy. Face of stark beauty. Lens of the molded moon. In a city cut like gem of conscious stone. And wonderful pasture of our gleaming coast. Right form I see eternity's luminous dreams. Tribes, <coughs> tribes. Tribes. Mm. So around her, the um, the deathless nations. It seems even there there are different nations, but they are all immortal, and those beings, peoples moved and spoke. Souls, all of them are souls of a luminous celestial joy, a heavenly joy that's full of light. So they have such beautiful faces, faces of stark beauty. It's almost too much to bear to see the beauty of these faces. And it's as if their limbs, their bodies, have been shaped out of light, molded out of that ray from above. And they live in cities, cities that are as if carved. They look like gems, carved gemstones, as if they've been cut out of conscious stone. Those are the cities cut like gems of conscious stone. And wonderful pastures. Pastures are grasslands where horses and cows and sheep can graze. And on gleaming coasts there, were, there are seas 
So there are also coasts, the borders between the, the land and the sea, with sand and where the sea meets the land. So in all these places, these bright forms of these beings are seen. These are the tribes, the, the peoples, full of light, who belong to that eternal world. Would you read? Yes. Blindly, blindly. Yes. So this is such a beautiful idea. Above Savitri, up in the sky, up in the heavens, there are individual godheads, individual forms of divinity. And they are whirling the spheres, the heavenly spheres, the we can think of the stars and the planets they're being moved round by divinities hmm? this is an idea we find in the Greek philosopher Aristotle he, th he thought the earth was at the center of a whole series of spheres hmm? and that these spheres had holes in them. He imagined them as, I don't know what stuff he imagined them made of, but uh, there were, the closest one to the earth is the moon. So there there was a big hole, the light coming through. And further out there were the the spheres of the planets and then the fixed stars. Yeah? And all these spheres were moving and they each sphere made a special sound as it moved. So this is where this idea of the music of the spheres comes from. That, uh, and of course he also, I don't know how literally he took it, but his idea was that they were being pushed around. The spheres were being moved around. They were being moved around by divinities like this. And the reason why they were moving, the force that kept them moving, was the force of love for the, the one divinity, the Origin, origin and source of all this. Uh, it's probably a very poor um, description of Aristotle's idea, but something there like that. There was no science of physics at that time. Hmm? There no at that time so. Well, there was a surprising amount of um, mathematics, mm -hmm. but um, this was a kind of conception at that time. So, Sri Aurobindo is somehow referring to this. You know, that, that there, there are these rhythming God's heads in a rhythmical way, moving, whirling the spheres around. And he says, those spheres are wrapped. They are in ecstasy. They are moving, but they are fixed. And he says, our stars are somehow imitating the movements of those um, wrapped, mobile fixities. Here, in our world, 
those movements and those fixities are blindly sought by the huge erring orbits of our stars. The orbits of our stars are um, not perfectly circular. In those days they believed everything had to be perfect. No? Or erring, it means uh, not keeping to exactly the perfect line. Lena. Ecstatic voices smoke at hearing sports. Each movement found a music all its own. Sounds, bells, of words upon unfading bars. The colors of whose plumage had been caught from the rainbow of imagination's wings. One more line. Immortal fragrance at the even Yes. So what can she hear? She can hear voices. Voices that are ecstatic. They are in bliss. This is as if coming into the ears and playing on the, the chords of hearing. So each movement in that world found a music all its own, a very, very special melody and harmony. There are birds. They sit upon unfading boughs. The leaves don't die and the flowers on those boughs don't die. They are unfading. They are always there. Hmm? And the birds also have beautiful colors, plumage, that refers to the feathers of the birds. You know? They are wonderful colors. It's as if those colors have been caught from a rainbow, not a rainbow such as we really see, but the most perfect and glorious rainbow we could possibly imagine. And the whole atmosphere, the breeze, the little breeze that's coming, is packed with immortal fragrance, wonderful perfume that goes on and on and on. Ellen will read one more sentence. The million children of the underlying spirit bloom few unnumbered stars of few delight, nestling for sh shelter in the unknown sky. Feeling flower masses look this low, laughing. laughing eyes. Yes, so <laughs> this is describing the the flowers in the forest, those groves on the edge of the forest where flowers grow because there's some sunlight. No? Those, he says, those groves, they seemed like moved bosoms, bosoms that are moving with emotion. And behind in the forest itself, there are depths, trembling depths, also moving with delight. There, the million children of the undying spring. There it's always spring. And there are so many flowers, uncountable flowers, millions of them. You know? They are blooming like stars that can't be counted, of all different colors, of huge delight. And they are nestling. This is what uh, baby birds do in their, in their nests or in their close to their mother. You know, they are um, feeling safe and protected. You know? Nestling for shelter 
in their emerald sky. They look like stars, but they are not in the sky. They are in the grass, in the, on the bushes, in the, at the edge of the forest. So all those million children of the undying spring, they are masses and masses of flowers. And they are something magical about them, fairy. This is not usually the way that we spell the word fairy. This is a poetic way of doing it. And Sri Aurobindo uses it with this spelling several times in the poem to suggest something enchanting, magical. Mm -hmm. So those little stars, those wonderful flowers, it's as if they are laughing. They have laughing eyes. They are looking out at us. Perhaps we'll read one more paragraph, Narendra, uh, one more sentence. The dancing chaos and endless fantasy eternized to heavens ever with his sight. The clouding patterned glow of marble stints, which floats across the curtain lids of dream. Yes. So how he puts these words together. So he's describing the sea, the sea which dances, you know, and as it dances, it reflects amazing colors, iridescent, all the colors of the rainbow, shining. You know. So it is dancing for heaven to watch. You know. And heaven doesn't close its eyes. This is a world of everlasting day. There's no night, there's no darkness. So there's this dancing, but it's eternal. And it preserves for that heaven, heaven's ever wakeful sight the, the, the wonderful colors, the crowding petal glow of marvels tints. Tints are shades of color. They are so wonderful. They are like the petals of all those millions of flowers. They glow like petals and they are crowding these waves dancing with their different colors. So these, they are reflecting the kind of colors that float across the curtained lids of dream, lids, eyelids. When we close our eyes and dream, we may see marvelous colors that we can't see with our eyes open. Or we may imagine marvelous colors that we can't see. Mm. We'll stop there. For two. This said the lowest of the seven immortal earths. Yes, it was a heaven. And this, yes, it's the closest one to us. So the description of that continues for quite a few pages to page 678. So we can read these lines together from page 672, line 54. Plains lay that seemed the expanse of God's wide sleep. Thought's wings climbed up towards heaven's vast repose, lost in blue deeps of immortality. A changed earth nature 
felt the breath of peace. Air seemed an ocean of felicity, or the couch of the unknown spiritual rest, a vast quiescence swallowing up all sound into a voicelessness of utter bliss. Even matter brought a close spiritual touch, all thrilled with the imminence of one divine. The lowest of these earths was still a heaven, translating into the splendor of things divine, the beauty and brightness of terrestrial scenes. Eternal mountains, ridge on gleaming ridge, whose lines were graved as on a sapphire plate, and etched the borders of heaven's lustrous noon, climbed like piled temple stairs, and from their heads of topless meditation heard below the approach of a blue pilgrim multitude and listened to a great arriving voice of the wide travel hymn of timeless seas. A chanting crowd from mountain bosoms slipped past branches fragrant with a sigh of flowers, hurrying through sweetnesses with revel leaps, the murmurous rivers of felicity divinely rippled honey-voiced desires, mingling their sister eddies of delight. Then, widening to a pace of calm-lipped muse, down many glimmered estuaries of dream went whispering into lakes of liquid peace. On a brink held of senseless ecstasy and guarding an eternal poise of thought sad sculptured souls dreaming by rivers of sound in changeless attitudes of marble bliss Around her lived the children of God's day in an unspeakable felicity, a happiness never lost, the immortal's ease, a glad eternity's blissful multitude. Around the deathless nations moved and spoke, souls of a luminous celestial joy, faces of stark beauty, limbs of the moulded ray. In cities cut like gems of conscious stone, and wonderful pastures, and on gleaming coasts, bright forms were seen, 
eternity's luminous tribes. Above her, rhythming godheads whirled the spheres, wrapped mobile fixities, here blindly sought by the huge erring orbits of our stars. Ecstatic voices smote at hearing's chords. Each movement found a music all its own. Songs thrilled of birds upon unfading boughs, the colours of whose plumage had been caught from the rainbow of imagination's wings. Immortal fragrance packed the quivering breeze. In groves that seemed moved bosoms and trembling depths, the million children of the undying spring bloomed, pure unnumbered stars of hued delight nestling for shelter in their emerald sky. Fairy flower masses looked with laughing eyes. A dancing chaos, an iridescent sea Eternized to heaven's ever wakeful sight, the crowding petal glow of marvel's tints which float across the curtained lids of dreams.